This podcast bonus was originally recorded November 2018 at the home of Robert and Nena Thurman in upstate New York. To learn more about the Bob Thurman podcast, please visit bobthurman.com. Okay, Abjit Evo Dadella, Umbaja Badozani, Hong Hong Peswaha, Tugur Dadella, Um Sarubur Dakini, Vajavani, Hong Hong Peswaha, Timber Nidella, Um Shi, Vajahe Rudu, Kang Hong Hong Pe, Dakini Jala Shambaram Swaha, Dewar Nidella, Um Shi, Haha Hong Hong Pe, Um Shi Dewar Nidella, Um Shi, Vajahe Rudu, Kang Hong Hong Pe, Dakini Jala Shambaram Swaha, to go need a um, she ha ha hum pe, Jimber Dadella, um, but the better than ye hum hum pe, so ha. Uh, tell what Dadella, um, some of the Dakini, but the Valley, but the other than ye ho ho hum pe, 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 so ha. Not times a cut of my Ursa toy, young god, never. Not them down pens and shells or sing Ursa tube, numbered into jur. Okay, hello, I just read that as a good omen because I'm just back from Bhutan and I'm not totally groggy from jet lag as I have been the last uh, five, six days since I got back. And I had a wonderful trip there in one of our Tibet house pilgrimage tourist trips where we visit a Buddhist country and particularly Bhutan is a Tibetan, culturally Tibetan Buddhist country, although of course it's Bhutan, it's not Tibet, but it's culturally Tibetan. And um, so I especially enjoyed those kind of pilgrimage trips because I do love the Tibetan culture, which is uh, steeped in the insight of the Buddha that uh, reality is actually perfectly okay. Reality is bliss. Reality is nirvana. Unreality is this world of suffering. So that's something that even in the very, very most fundamental levels of Buddhism at the renunciation level is clear. Even though they do sort of act like there's a dualism between samsara and nirvana, where nirvana is ultimately a different place, which is withdrawn, which, which hint or which um, impression is allowed to stand for this fundamental level because people can't imagine that the world in which they are suffering is actually nirvana because they don't want to take responsibility for misunderstanding it. And they, and they don't think they do, right? We don't think so. We think we know where we are and what we're doing, you know. So the idea that we we don't know what we're doing and we don't know where we are and that if we knew where we were and what we were doing we would be blissfully happy if we really knew what the reality of it was is so that's kind of an interesting context by the way this relates to what i want to sort of mainly talk about today which is the whole issue of gurus and sex and money and power and other things about the guru-disciple relationship. But this has been causing a lot of distress in the um, Buddhist world. And even all the way to Bhutan, uh, I was uh, the land of gross national happiness, by the way, which is, emerges from the you know, Buddhist cultural ethos, you know, Tibetan Buddhist cultural ethos, Indian and Tibetan Buddhist cultural ethos. And um, which is a wonderful concept, one that's necessary for the whole world to learn from, actually. And I was giving a talk there in Bhutan. I think it's on YouTube, possibly, my talk there recently, wearing a Bhutanese robe, which I enjoy wearing when I go on uh, there. Anyway, uh, people were still worried. There was the scandal in the Rigpa organization by the guru, misbehavior. There was a scandal in the Shambhala organization by the Guru's misbehavior. And there have been many more, but, but um, also in the Zen world, in the Hindu world, in the psychiatry world. There's all these um, abuse of power relating most grievously to sexuality 
and somewhat also to money and also to just status, you know. Coming from a great misunderstanding of the guru-disciple relationship. So that's, that's sort of mainly what I want to talk about today. And I just, I read this little bit from the, a certain sadhana, which shows the union of the male and female Buddhas in the super bliss machine tantra, where the, each uh, male and female have in their different chakras the mantras of the uh, super bliss machine, chakra sambara, and uh, the two mantras make them kind of merge in this sort of global, ruby colored global, a blissful interaction. This as an omen, I wanted to mention that. And uh, this has to do with the fact that, you know, sexuality is not some sort of special zone of energy that, uh, you know, it's, it's either paid attention to or not paid attention to. In a way, it is like the primal energy of the universe. And the fact of its male-female orientation in, the, in what the Buddhists call the desire realm is um, significant. And since reality is nirvana, it's also not excluded from nirvana. Even though in renunciant level, a foundational renunciant level, where one is trying to get away from basic lust, basic hate, basic misknowing or delusion, uh, one wants to separate oneself from that and become detached from those three basic addictive emotions and um, be able to not be driven by them involuntarily. But that doesn't mean that they are to be destroyed. They are a particular part of the universe that's to be destroyed. They are actually primal energies. And so once one has, has destroyed their hold over one, where one is not driven by them, one then can turn to use the basic energies of the universe, oneself, one's loving, compassionate, enlightened self, or nearly enlightened, or somewhat enlightened self, can use those energies. So that's, a, that's, a, that's an important point. And actually, it's not particularly Tantra, you know. The historic, historicist post-colonial, not quite post-colonial, rather, I should say, the, the way my Cherokee friend, Jason, uh, I forget his full name at the moment, um, elder moment, sorry. Anyway, he always likes to say, not quite post-colonial. You know, he's a Cherokee, I, I mean, yeah, yeah he's, a, he's a Cherokee who teaches theology at the University of Georgia in, 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 in uh, Athens, Georgia. <clears throat> and he's living, therefore, on land that is owned by the Cherokees, but robbed by Andrew Jackson. So when he says not quite post-colonial, it has a particular zing to it. <laughs> you know, they were lured to Oklahoma by the pretense that that would never be robbed from them. And of course, all the oil companies and different politicians and settlers have robbed that since quite a bit. So, um, anyway, that's a digression. So, <clears throat> so therefore, sexuality is a reality to be considered. <clears throat> and um, therefore, Buddhahood, past the fundamental renunciatory level, is kind of presented as a Buddha himself is presented as a kind of not necessarily asexual, but kind of motherly looking most Buddhas are. You know, the genitalia of a Buddha can be, a Buddha can be distinguished from a Jain Mahavira or other great Jain Jinas, as they say, victors, enlightened beings from the Jain perspective, by the sort of lack of any phallic level in the groin, you know. And this is one of the signs of a Buddha that the, the penis is retracted like a horse in a sheath. So it's sort of a male-female, even the organ it subliminally creates a message that Buddha is kind of beyond either differentiation as male and female, which is accurate. 
because a Buddha is not restricted to the desire realm, although a Buddha's humanoid body is manifested in what's called the desire realm, where people are bound by sexual different, gender differentiation. A Buddha is equally present at all times in the form realm, where the bodies are not are male or androgynous, let's say. The Brahmakayika de deities of the form realm are androgynous, and in the formless realm they have no bodies. So Buddha is equally at home in all of those realms simultaneously. Have to be aware, that's one of the definitions of a Buddha. Although they show a body in a humanoid form, there are aspects of the body that indicate the Buddha's much larger presence than just a being in the, the human being in the desire realm. So all this is to connect to the idea of guru-disciple relation. Now there's no doubt. So, oh yeah, so yeah, in Tantra, and the, sort of the proof that Buddha himself taught, from our point of view, Buddha himself taught Mahayana and taught Tantra in the same breath that he taught Theravada, Mahasangika, the so-called 18 different Nikaya Buddhist sects in India, which were slightly different with different elements of their Vinaya discipline and, and philosophical emphases, but basically were all dualistic in the sense of presented that you have to separate from this, this illusory world and reach another world, a nirvana world. So and that because, as I said, they are taught foundationally for we basic beings, people like me and you, most of you probably, uh, we can't imagine this world being nirvana because we, it causes us a lot of grief. And so it's natural that we would assume we're getting somewhere else to reach this state of perfect freedom from suffering. And Buddha didn't question that, although he planted hints even in that teaching that some sort of disembodied, seemingly absolute state, which he describes in the four formless realms, in his in his ge geography, you know, of the four formless realms of, you know, infinite space, infinite consciousness, a seeming absolute nothingness, and beyond consciousness and unconsciousness. In describing those, and he's stating that all of them are not nirvana. He's kind of giving a hint that that any sort of state beyond this world cannot be this relative world. If it's beyond it, it's also relative. It can't be the absolute condition of this world. I mean, that's a clear hint that he gives. And he also gives it clearly when people ask, is there a self beyond? Is there a self once you reach nirvana? Is someone being there to enjoy it? Where is it? What is it? You know, he keeps refusing to really say, except that it's a cessation of suffering. He doesn't really describe the place, sometimes called the city of Nirvana, even a city not really being an, a disembodied, disembodied place, is it? City. City is a differentiated relational place, isn't it? So, um, so, the Westerners say that, you know, Buddhism in India was in a process, this comes from the British colonial idea of the decay that, under which societies that they conquer have suffered until they come to lift them up as a white man's burden. So Buddhism suffered a decline in India where it was originally good, clean, sort of Protestant asceticism Second, it was corrupted by sort of Hindu, Hindu deity proliferation by making Buddha into a deity about 500 years later with Mahayana. And third, it was really corrupted with sex and ferocity, sex and force, sex and violence in Tantra when they were really crumbling into the sort of sensuous jungle of India. And then finally, it was just rejected even by the Indians and disappeared. So, or, that's one trope that came, became more later, but another one is, or it became disarmed and conquered by Muslims, which the colonial British were considering a really low thing, since they, they, they've been, from Christianity's point of view, Islam is something wrong, because they're not acknowledging the deity, divinity of Christ, and they think that more prophets are needed, and they don't like Christ being reduced to a prophet, as the Muslims did as Muhammad did. Generously and wonderfully, he loved Isa, you know. 
He liked Christ. And he even liked Mary, although he was against goddesses, but he liked Mary. So under that trope, you know, Tantra is some late thing added in, and it's also a degenerate thing. But in our view of it, Tantra is in the Buddha's original teaching. Because the original teaching is that if we gain wisdom, which means knowledge of reality, we become blissfully free of suffering. Which means that our reality is already blissfully free of suffering. So that means that we are laboring under the delusion of thinking we are uh, our reality is an alienated being in the middle of a difficult universe, being banged on and assaulted from all sides and suffering. And so that is our delusion. And we, when we come to, and, and yet that world is unreal. And when we come to know what really is, we discover we're Buddha. Or we're, of course, in the earlier form, they just said Arhat, you know, free of, free of any enemy, enmity, free of and worthy of all, all honor, honorable. So the basic insight of Tantra, the mandala, you know, you enter the mandala, and in the mandala you simulate a presence you will eventually enjoy for real, experientially for real, when you become a Buddha. And you simulate that experience in order to accelerate your progress to that experience of being a Buddha. And, um, but that's right embedded in the earliest possible teaching in the fact that the third noble of the, the four noble truths, where the, only the third one is reality, first, second, and fourth are different versions of unreality. Tantra's right there, in fact. Mahayana is right there in the Buddha's presence. People would walk into the Buddha's presence and feel transformed instantly because his presence was a mandala. Now, the way this is explicated in, in uh, so they're, in, they're initiated in a way just by meeting him, in other words, without the formalities of a mandala and a, ritual or anything like, and he would just say, when he would see that change, then he would go, eh, hibiku, and then in the literature it said that their clothing would change, their hair would beard, etc., would fly off if they were males, and they would become mendicants. We call it monks, but in a way they weren't seeking solitude, they were seeking membership in a community of mendicants, those living in the mandala around the Buddha those simulating wisdom as a way of accelerating their attempt to attain it. And by a meaning which, which means cancelling their delusion, overcoming their delusion with the wisdom of reality. And wisdom is not a resignation to their delusion, it's an overcoming of it, destruction of the delusion, right? So, so that is Tantra. So therefore, Coming back to the guru-disciple relationship. Well, no, yeah, before coming to that, back to tantra, tantra, formal tantra. And therefore, another important thing, Buddha kept saying to the student, don't just depend on me. Don't think that I, by just believing that I'm something special, you'll be something special. That won't work. Because you, you are the one who has that understanding. You, you are gripped by the delusion, and you also have the understanding capacity within yourself, the intelligence, to become wisdom, to know your own reality that you actually do have, and thereby be Buddha yourself. So he canceled with those people the kind of authority thing that was part of Vedic, Vedist, Indian Vedist, as we can call it, Vedist, not Hindu yet, but Vedist culture, where the paternal, patriarchal, so social ordinary social thing was reflected spiritually by the authority, father-like authority of the guru. And guru means heavy, something on weighing you down on top of your head, you know, authority. You know. So he kind of canceled that. He said that the teacher is a kalyana mitra, a virtuous friend. And you yourself have to understand it. I can help you. I can't actually perfectly describe it. Even by memorizing something I say, it won't give you the understanding. 
because it's indescribable, this amazing reality. It's so amazing. But you can understand it yourself, and I can give vectors and pathways and teaching paths which can bring you to where you can develop your own wisdom. So he, first of all, he canceled that sort of authority thing. And um, later when, when um, Mahayana and Tantrayana were translated into Tibetan and, and Theravada, you know, the Sarvastivada version, uh, the, the renunciant level, were translated into Tibetan, the word guru as a heavy was not translated by the word heavy, jiwa. It was translated rather by the word lama. And lama doesn't really translate literally guru. It translates, it, it translates anuttara, beyond which there is nothing, beyond which there is no one or nothing. So unexcelled is the best, or unsurpassed. So Lama is a being who you can't get past because he's like a reflection of your higher self, sort of like that. He's not an authority on top of your head, Lama, not supposed to be. And that's embedded in the, in the language of the early Indian and Tibetan translation teams. They work together, Sanskrit and Tibetan. So now we come to formal Tantra, where a guru initiates you into a mandala when you're ready, and you choose the guru to do that, or the lama, rather, to do that when you know enough to really wish to do Tantra, you do, and you know enough about it to know what you're doing, you know what the vows are, you know what the discipline is ahead of time, because you don't get the initiation unless you know what you're promising in, 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 in return for receiving it. You know, if you don't know your vows, and then you repeat some vow, repeat after me by a guru, obviously you're not really making the vow. So then you're just getting a blessing, if you have a good attitude about it. But you're not really getting the initiation, you're getting a blessing. You have to first learn about it, so you know what you're doing to truly receive the initiation, which is why the elder lamas will take again and again and again the initiations and enjoy it and, and receive it deeper and deeper each time, actually, over the years, you know, from qualified lama. So, uh, it therefore, however, what, it's, what it is, is it's pushing, what the initiation actually is, it's kind of pushing the pressure of a kind of double bind cognitive dissonance onto the initiant, the one who's being initiated. Because, initiate, you know, because when you enter the mandala, you're the, you know, the, and the final with the fourth initiation in unexcelled yoga, the Lama says to you, now you are Buddha. And yet you don't feel like Buddha just by receiving that statement. You, you, therefore you have to see, feel that you, the Buddha is present to you. You also don't really see a human Lama as a Buddha, as what you expect a Buddha to be. But you, you said you're supposed to see that Lama as indivisible from the Buddha form you're being initiated into. So actually then you do have to see, you have to imagine, you have to sort of superimpose your imagination of a nice Tibetan Lama as Kuya Samaja, Kala Chakra, Hevajra, you know, uh, Guya Garba, you know, whatever deity it may be, whatever deity, divine Buddha form it may be. Vajra Yogini, even a female, Tara. <clears throat> you have to see the Lama as that. Which means for the normal practitioner, you're kind of visualizing and imagining. And um, different people with different affinities based on different previous lives experience will sometimes vividly have a kind of vision and others will just be working at it. But to the degree to which you can feel the presence of the actual Buddha 
or and, and there are even initiations into Shakyamuni, so you feel the live presence of Shakyamuni through some nice Tibetan gentleman or lady, um, you know, female incarnation or or lama. Uh, you uh, you know to the extent which you can really feel the presence, then you then you really feel the credibility and the possibility of imagining yourself being like that. So that's why they have this practice of what's called dagnang, you know, dagnang practice, meaning purifying your, your experience, purifying your perception, purifying your intuition, and um, failing to see it, taking that as your error, and imagining that it is really not the way you see it, but the way it should be, okay? So that is the basis of the statement that you cannot, you must follow your Lama, you must believe in your Lama, you must place faith in your Lama, etc., you know, all this sort of thing. You know. And unfortunately, that's the basis, therefore, of the abuse that the, some of these gurus who dish out initiations to people who are not really knowing what they are, and who are not really capable of putting that kind of thing into practice, and who still have what is called the pride of ordinariness, which means just the confidence that what they see as the ordinary world is the real thing, and what they feel about their own identity is the real way they are. So they, since they're like that, then they tell oh, you're a Buddha. Oh yeah, now imagine yourself Buddha. That's just a, that can't really if <laughs> they can't practice that. They can't shift that confidence into something they can only imagine at all. And yet they're told they have to shift that, uh, their, their experience of, of, the, of the Lama in a way they don't actually see the Lama. So they have to actually put themselves into, into a hopeful, a very difficult cognitive bind, double cognitive dissonance bind, double bind, and they cripple themselves. They cripple their intelligence with that because they're not capable of that. So gurus who dish out anyway initiation and then use the aspect that I'm Buddha in your eyes or you have to, anything you see about me that doesn't look like Buddha, you have to imagine it is. And then they abuse you. They tell you to deliver sex favors to them. They tell you to deliver money to them. They tell you to deliver service to them. They tell you all kinds of abusive things. And worst of all, they cripple your learning ability. Because you're already put, well, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. They're making you helpless like that. This can only safely be taught to someone who already has learned thoroughly some level of detachment from their passions, hate, lust, and delusion, and, and you know, conviction, determined rightness, righteousness, righteous conviction, which is delusive conviction. And they've already gained some detachment from all of that. They have cultivated the positive, loving mind of the Bodhisattva, altruistic mind of the Bodhisattva. And because, you know, you have to take that vow to receive tantric initiation, Buddhist tantric initiation, and you can't sincerely take that vow unless you have already attained some degree of that of freedom. And furthermore, you can't sincerely take it because it's meaningless unless you have understood the reality of your multiple lives, which is part of the detachment thing, realizing the value of your human life. You have to have that prayer because you really have to be sure that you're, you're messing with your embodiment because you're going to lose this embodiment and you're going to have another one. You're not going to ever be free of embodiment. You already realize that. You're not engaged in dualistic Buddhism where you think you're just going to leave all embodiment. No way. So therefore, you can generally have compassion. You can generally have the Bodhisattva attitude and mind, spirit, functioning in you through the vow. And then finally, you have to realize some degree of emptiness, selflessness. You have to have some degree of wisdom already. Enough at least to have eroded 
through contemplating emptiness, through understanding inferentially the, that emptiness makes relativity imperative. You have to know that, have had that experience to some degree, to have then somewhat melted your attachment to your conventional identity, to the world's conventional description, and therefore be able to give almost equal weight to, some, to what you imagine. You still may habitually see it, like it seems solid and seems to have what, we do, what they call intrinsic reality or self, intrinsic objectivity, intrinsic identity, you feel yourself as, and you still may feel that way. But you have, you have, you know the inference of at least of emptiness and some degree of experience, where you realize that any way you feel that a relative thing is absolute, is really what it seems to be, is erroneous, and then that has that has loosened the hold of your habitual, you know, identity habit, as they would call it. So then you're open to cultivating different identity. You're responsible for shaping your identity. You don't think you're nobody or nothing, although you go past a threshold like that, experientially, but, but you also realize that nothing is nothing, so you can't be stuck there. So, but you have, it's loosened your misplaced conviction in the reality of the relative world. So therefore, you, you and, and that this then puts you, throws you into taking responsibility for your own experience of, your own relative experience of the relative world, and enables you to try to shape it in the ideal ways that mandala meditation, tantric meditation, creation stage practice, the action, performance, and yoga tantras, and anaxal yoga tantra practice the way that our maha anu and ati yoga, as the Nyingma say, you have, um, you have now begun to have capability of working with that, learning about it and working with it. So, whereas if, you, if, someone gives you, if someone somehow tells you you're now Buddha when you have your rigid identity habit, and then uh, in addition to crippling you with a, with a pressure to imagine things in a way you are unable to. In addition to that, uh, they prevent you from learning anything. Because then you take your rigid identity up and you say, well, I have a magical identity of being Buddha. And I guess it's, but it's, I feel like I'm still just the same me. But now that same me is Buddha. And then you become megalomaniac. That's the terrible danger of it. And uh, an aspect of that megalomania is you project a kind of megalo a maniacal perfection upon the guru, the lama, and you become completely subjugated to that lama. But it's only a set of sort of decisions that you've made. It isn't an experience. And therefore, when the lama finally something disillusions you, you really hate that person. And then you hate the whole magnificent teaching of the Buddha, because you think that guy is just doing what the Buddha does. And this happens all too easily. Very, very, therefore it's a really terrible karma of such a guru to abusively do that. So what is needed? Now in Tibet, this also happened actually, and in Asia, and in India, and in Japan, and wherever Tantra, Mongolia, wherever Tantra was practiced, there are people who abused it. And therefore it was made, it, that's why it was kept esoteric. And somehow in the modern world, His Holiness Dalai Lama and some other enlightened lamas have decided, different ones in different ways and to different degrees, that some deeper psychological aspect of it can be shared in general. People can at least know what it is. And, it, and therefore make a decision not to abuse it, not to try, not to, not to superimpose it on themselves when they're not ready for it, by knowing what it is. 
and also be suspicious of people who would impose it, use it to impose on them in order to exploit them. Which had, did happen before in Tibet and everywhere, you know. So it remains a danger, but we, we have to address it in our particular way now, those of us who consider it a treasure of method, of practice, of art. Um, some extraordinary methods and arts of self-creation, self-cultivation, that are possibly usable by some who work hard to get to be, to on the prerequisites to be able to do it. Okay? So, in regard to the scandal, guru, the guru scandals that have been taking place, therefore, one, one can separate oneself and in some sense socially punish and ostracize a, per, a, a lama who abuses the sacred trust of being a spiritual teacher to exploit students, using spirituality, spiritual things as an excuse and also as a method. And one can do that. One will not go to hell for doing that. Actually, one should do that. One will, it's ethical to do that. It protects others, protects yourself. But if in the process of the previous relation, in addition to the abuse, there was some genuine learning, because everything is not 100% black and white, if that's the case, one cannot hate that miscreant. You know, in the preliminary teachings, one learns to meditate on demons and evil people and try to develop tolerance and even love for them and compassion for them. So why would one then take an evil lama who did the evil things, wrong things, but why would one then think of them as like a Satan and overdo it, you know, and hate everything about them and throw out the whole thing just because somebody abused it? You know, it's like somebody, you know, stole a car or, you know, a vehicle, created something and drove off with it and ran some people over and then one finally controls and removes that person from the driver seat, one doesn't necessarily have to destroy the car for possible good use. You might use the car to take the guru to jail. <laughs> That's it. Maybe. Anyway, my point is, so we still love even the bad gurus, if we learned anything from them. Especially this is important for those who were abused. We love the teaching, we love them, we consider them no longer justified, qualified to misuse that, and we ask them to try to rehabilitate themselves. And if necessary, we use law, and we use uh, media, and we use reason to do that. Even you can see, you know, Marpa, the great enlightened translator who was Milarepa's teacher in ancient Tibet, you know, archetypal kind of person. Milarepa never saw him again after a certain point in life, but he used to invoke him and sing his praises and see him in the sky. Think of him, think of all the flood of light, of blessings of all Buddhas and Yidams and Dakinis and whatever coming through that Marpa. But we know from the history of Marpa, subsequent to his teaching of Pilarempa, that he made mistakes. He did wrong things. He, dis he disobeyed Dakinis and gave his son a teaching that was supposed to not be given. He even tried to use Milarepa's thaumaturgical powers to send hailstorms at neighbors he was annoyed with and things like that. So he, he was a little, he beat his wife. He was a little abusive. But, but Milarepa could remove himself from that abuse and yet still meditate in the sky, what a great person, in order to maintain his connection to that. So, so this is the kind of psychological subtlety that we have to 
deal with. And then even we could say to the extreme, we could go to the extreme there, we could say that someone who was really, was, was more or less ready for the teaching, who was given it by a person who was somewhat abusive and not perfectly enlightened, but gave it to that person, that disciple, enough that the disciple was able to go beyond even the teacher who gave it, then that disciple would still be using that Buddha, that Lama, that Lama who had faults, as if it were a perfect Buddha, in order to completely transform his own faults, or her own faults. And we could say that that could still be okay for that disciple. They don't have to join in rejecting that. That, that level of person wouldn't have to join in that. They could stick with in their mind, they could stick with that guru. And they actually then might really go beyond it even. It's possible. So it isn't so black and white. Someone caused harm to one, but the other one wasn't harm because that one had a kind of advanced level of something from previous life or from something they attained, some experience they had, where they, they could use even something dished to them in an impure vessel. They could still use it. This is possible. On the other hand, the one who's not there and who simply was abused, they can revere the teaching and they can revere whatever they learned that was still useful and they can strongly condemn the worldly manifestation of that Lama without being sent to hell. So we have to, we have to be very specific in each case and see it very, very clearly. The crazy wisdom excuse might only be used by one who was much advanced. But still it could be. But it's not a general worthwhile excuse for everybody. So maybe I've confused us all more. I don't know. But this is a very important thing too. Now, what I'm, I'm really thrilled about, I want to turn to another aspect of this, and that is my dear friend and mentor and Lama, as well as Kali, because, you know, you can, you know, a, a Lama who is not themselves somehow rigidly stuck in some sort of identity of being an authority, and yet is capable of being authoritative and genuine teacher, you can be sometimes in a set, some setting, they can be your Lama, and in another setting, they can be a colleague, and even just a friend. And there's a, there's a resilience and a flexibility of identity and status in all directions. This is what we really have to achieve. Now it is, I think, the great adepts were like this with one another in ancient India. And um, their disciples, they wanted their disciples to become able to be like that with them. Zen, by the way, has a similar thing. Zen puts you in a double bind when you say, just by sitting, you're a Buddha. That puts you in a similar type of double bind. So now, um, and this is the Dr. Nida Chenaksang. Chenaksang is his Amdo Tibetan name of his family. Tsang means family. Chenak is uh, very good. His name, Nida. Is it, we say Nida, it's written with just N-I, but it's actually Nida. And Nima means sun, and Dawa means moon. So he's Dr. Sun and Moon. <laughs> I like that. Anyway, I think he's really great. And he wrote a book called Karma Mudra, The Yoga of Bliss. And Karma Mudra in the high tantras is a mudra itself, which means gesture or seal. It is a name for a partner in yogas that are using sexual yoga. And we say sexual because it involves the genital chakra and the organs it can involve, but it can involve. But it can, it can also be done just visualizationally and meditationally within a single body of a single gender as well. It's not only involved with a partner, but anyway, mudra means a partner. And there are different kinds, dharma mudra, jnana mudra, Mahamudra is the highest one, where you make love with the whole universe, with Maha means the universe. So rather than a 
person. <laughs> but karma mudra is action. Karma means action. And uh, it, it actually tends to mean ritual action in this kind of context. And so that's where you have a partner in a ritual of a kind of yoga where you need two bodies, where you kind of, you are yourself with a partner, either yourself a female with a male partner, or in which case the karma mudra would be male, or a male with a female partner, in which case the karma mudra would be female, which in the history, of course, of Buddhism has more been the case. Because the males have been more, male chauvinist societies are all, all the Eurasian societies up until today are still male chauvinist. We have not yet had a perfect, at least not in recorded history, a perfect um, thing. You know, a perfect society. Yet, although Shambhala perhaps will be, will be that. And um, there may have been earlier periods in which there was. Anyway, he wrote this book called Karma Mudra the Yoga of Bliss, subtitled Sexuality in Tibetan Medicine and Buddhism. And he's a, he is himself a, a lama in a tantric context in the Nyingma system, in the teaching of Ati Yoga, Maha Yoga, Anu Yoga, Ati Yoga, uh, Dzogchen, you know, type thing, as well as specific tantras, I think, as well. And, um, but he also is a doctor, so he knows all kinds of, not only tantric, but other kinds of sexual abuse and their terrible impact on people's health, on people's psyches, on people's lives. So he's, and he's a deeply compassionate man. And um, cheerful and deeply compassionate. And um, so he wrote this right in the teeth of these scandals. Very courageously, I have to play it. This is the cover of the book I'm showing. And um, I was worried about it. What is it going to be? And I was thrilled. He completely puts in their place the abusive gurus with great detail. And he gets very clear about it. And uh, common myths and misconceptions about karma mudra, he talks about that. But then he does go on about where people who have a good male-female relationships or male-male relationships, he gets even into that area, LGBTQ2, whatever, you know, trans thing, he gets into that. And he talks about not high highfalutin, you know, like super world Buddha's routine, but how as human beings we can use our deep inner sensitivity, you know, these kind of inner chakras, the central channel and the chakras, you know, up and down the body, you know, I'm just showing that. I hope that it picks up the whole thing. Uh, the, the, it covers both pages, I hope so. And he, you know, how, how ordinary person can use that in an ordinary relationship, a marital relationship, a lover, boyfriend, girlfriend relationship, which is a healthy one, not an abusive one, to enhance and to make keep a kind of, you know, kindle, let's say even, a kind of spirituality of sexuality, which I think is wonderful and brilliant and outstanding. And it's sort of simple exercise. It doesn't involve massive things or being initiated by gurus or whatever. And he talks about it as being born of a kind of lay society in Tibetan society of people known as Ngakpas and Ngagmas, female and male. It's almost like a shaman, but it isn't some some kind of it's it's Buddhist thing, but it's someone who who sort of tries to be a professional yogi. It's almost like it's kind of a lay yoga. But it's a yoga that addresses these deeper energies of the central nervous system and the subtle nervous system, which is mobilized anyway in ordinary sexuality, often not very satisfyingly by people who are not adepts. But it is. And uh, did something come disconnected in the... No, I unconnected it for this. Our, our battery ran out on the projector one. Oh. When we did the second video. And, uh, but this is, so the audio is going to the iPhone? Yeah, it'll be okay. By Bluetooth, you mean? Yeah. Oh. Sorry, you have to cut that right, out. I'll clip it. So, so anyway, th this is really wonderful. I'm still studying it. I, I haven't, uh, I have no such mastery of such things myself, although I'm a 
51 year long married man and uh, there's always room for everything is perfect but there's always room for improvement as the great Zen master in California said Suzuki Roshi and um, and so I'm still studying this and looking into it you know and I think it's a nice middle ground between uh, sort of the very highest things you know I, I think I have given talks here before and I have given public talks about the high level of yogic athleticism involved in ultimate levels of unexcelled yoga tantra and I guess anu, anu yoga tantra this might mean uh, you know maha yoga anu yoga and ati yoga this might be anu yoga tantra in the in nyingma and and Zogt and ati yoga anu and ati yoga tantras in nyingma context but this is creation and perfection stage in Anaxal Yoga Tantra in the new text schools. And I've given talks about that defending against Western scholars who act like all this kind of stuff is just some monks who are horny and they want to run out and grab girls and just indulge themselves. And um, not that there were some who didn't behave like that, the abusive ones that we've talked about. But in defending that, in, the, in ancient time in India and, and in Tibet, you know, uh, you know, young women of some kind of low caste in the case of, uh, or no caste in the case of India, who live a life of slavery and drudgery more or less, and in Tibet some kind of very lower level people, they didn't have a caste system strictly speaking in Tibet, but there were some zones of people who were considered lower. And uh, that they might learn the Dharma, become yoginis, and join, you know, uh, tantric communities, and uh, and then become really high-level enlightened beings. Uh, I've defended that, and that it's not because by the argument that it's not ordinary sexuality, just kind of with a little melting in there, but really basically what what the psychologists would call genitally organized sexuality. That's not possible. The high level of sort of sexual yogas of the Anuksal Yoga Tantras are not uh, possible with only one partner being knowledgeable about them. Both have to be completely equally knowledgeable. And I think that sort of pretty much holds also with this Karma Mudra, both partners to do this um, these kind of uh, visualizations, uh, breath, breath yoga, some things involved, both have to do. If one of them is trying to do it and the other one is just, you know, wants to hump away, so to speak, <laughs> normal, huffing, humping and pumping, as people will say, then I think the other one will be distracted and unable to even practice the, the Karma Mudra level that he's, he mainly focuses on here. So, I have, so I've, done, I've talked about that, and then he's sort of, carving out this middle ground in this area. And I think that's really good. And I could say it might even defend future practitioners of yogas and yoginis, yogis and yoginis, from being predated upon by abusive gurus and lamas. Because they'll have some sense of their own, you know, inner subtle body and inner experience and be somewhat open in their inner sensitivities. And they will not fall for something about now go and and do some sexual service for somebody. They will not fall for that. They'll not they'll not be thinking that someone can just by making it with them or something is going to make them enlightened, which I think is unfortunately the pitch that the abusive gurus have used. So I think it's it's very good that he's addressed. He's sort of like the he's now become I think the McKinsey the Kinsey. Is it Kinsey or McKinsey? The McKinsey of the yogic, which might help Hindus too. Hindu yogi types. Because, Hindu, because uh, you know, Hatha Yoga is not just Yoga Sutra, you know, renunciative, dualistic Hinduism stuff. Hatha Yoga is tantric stuff. The whole business of asanas and opening up uh, nerve blockage, blockages and grantas, you know, knots and things. That's all really Tantra, because Tantra was a set of arts and techniques that both Buddhists and, and Hindus used 
uh, just as Hinduism itself is really a combination of Buddhism slash Jainism and Vedism, not just a descendant of Vedism by itself. But that's, that's another story, and we can talk about that at another time. Anyway, this is what I wanted to talk about. And so I think it's a useful book for people who are unhappy. I think there's a lot of unhappiness in the Buddhist world radiating out from these scandals, which involve pretty large-scale organizations, organizations that seem to be carrying on somewhat, but traumatized, and there are traumatized people. And I think the beauty and the wonder of the Buddha Dharma should not be trashed because somebody has abused, somebody who was represent, presenting themselves as a valid representative of it, abused their position and, and misused, misused the teachings. And one shouldn't throw them all out and also abandon whatever progress one did make in spite of being abused by learning whatever one learned. And one should try to be happy. And that's the best way to overcome the trauma and try to recover a kind of joy and resist burning anger on vindictive vengeance and spitefulness and, and overdoing the persecution even of the bad guys. They need rehabilitation. You know, prisons, Nagarjuna even, you know, 2,000 years ago, almost 2,000 years ago now, he, the king that he was used to advise, he told him, remember that prisoners, criminals, are just wayward children. They have gone wrong and they've harmed and they must be prevented from doing that. But it's not just a matter of punishing them, it's not going to help, just making them suffer teaching them, rehabilitating them, trying to bring them back to using their precious human life in a positive way. That's what prisons are for. They're not just for punishment. And he was totally against that 2,000 years ago, capital punishment, for example, even for murderers. Although not against imprisoning them and preventing them from killing people, of course, and so on. So. If you've learned one thing from Buddhism, it might be about not hating and not either yourself or another, even someone who harmed you. And, to, and also in the Lojong practice, which comes from Buddha and is channeled through Nagarjuna, Shantideva very strongly, and comes into Tibet with Atisha and the Kadambas, and then goes everywhere and in Tibet and all the Kagyu, Nyingma, Sakya, as well as Gelugpa schools, and even goes into the Bern religion, which is a different religion, but still using the same methodologies. You can try to use the adversity for your spiritual progress and not feel, oh, because I suffered and because I was harmed and because this guy was fake, then they're all fake and everything's fake and anything I did learn or develop, any development I did is fake and so on. Should not go there. And cheer up is key. <laughs> that's my message. Okay? So that's it. That's it for today. That's what I wanted to talk about. This video was brought to you in part to the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and listeners like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, including trips with Robert Thurman, please visit TibetHouse.us.